Again, good evening, everyone. Um, name is Cliff Pierre, one of the fellows here at Swedish Neuroscience Institute, and uh, excited for the ninth annual Trauma Spine Summit. And uh, first, I'd like to get started. We have a case here of a 69-year-old female uh, who we've been following in our clinic uh, with uh, presenting with neck pain that radiates uh, to the back of her skull for the last year or so. She had a fall. At the time, she was uh, using the bathroom and uh, um, fell forward, landed on her face, went to the ED, for which they uh, put her in a collar after getting further imaging and uh, discharged her where we began to closely follow her outpatient. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis. She's currently on steroids as well as uh, um, disease-modifying uh, medications. Uh, she had a prior C5-6 ACDF with the subsequent C2 T3 fusion by us, and then also a thoracopelvic fusion in the past. Uh, this is her most recent DEXA scan. Uh, again, noting um, um, ongoing osteoporosis, which she's being followed up by one of our uh, uh, colleagues as well. And we'll start treatment next spring. And then these are some of her interventions non-operatively uh, for her pain management. So uh, some representative images of what we see here. Um, I'll run through the, yeah. here again, um, noting an axial and sagittal view of CT cervical neck. Uh, so we see a C1 burst fracture, fractures through the anterior arch as well as posterior arch. She has a type two dense fracture um, through the base of C2. And then um, again, you see the prior fusion of C2 to T3, as well as the five, six, from before. Uh, these are representative AP and lateral upright films. And then this is just further progression of her uh, prior fracture at the uh, C1, C2. Um, and then this is her most recent follow-up scan coronal view. We'll show here, uh, again, just some representative images scanning through the coronal view. And then next slide. Again, noting a further gap at the C1, C2 um, where her prior fracture was. And so just uh, standing scoliosis films as follow-up from her prior uh, sur uh, surgeries. And then just a summary of what's going on. So uh, again, 69-year-old female with a C1 ring fracture and non-union at the odontoid status post fall about a year and a half ago, which we've been following closely in our clinic and now has persistent neck pain. So open up the floor for particular op options from our established faculty and... So none of our faculty is particularly shy. <laughs> See this, show, show me the C1 ring again, if you can, if, if you're able to do that. There's no displacement. Are you able to go through the axials? Yeah, I'm gonna, it's gonna okay. proceed to, so for the next one. And it's one year old, this fracture? One and a half years, yeah. You know, unfortunately, this is the consequences of C2 to T2. Yeah. Um, I have patients like this. One of the things you could have done in the beginning, potentially, you know, sometimes these things will do okay in a collar, but they don't heal. Okay. Um, is to just fix her to her skull, yeah. let the odontoid heal mm -hmm. in the beginning, and then take the hardware back out that you attach to the pelvis. Um, yeah. So we're, we're doing that more. I don't think you can do that in a year. Gotcha. It's not going to heal. So in the beginning, like if you have this, you know, the problem is you have this long lever arm yes. and you have the skull on top. Like You know this can't heal. There's no way this is going to heal. Um, and these are the ones, like when I talk about non-operative treatment of odontoids, these are the ones that give you problems because yep. you've got all the motions now with the odontoid fracture. And, and so in the beginning, like when you have it, just attaching to her skull at the odontoid heel and taking it out to try to give her motion back is not an unreasonable thing. Okay. At this point, you know, if she's having persistent pain, discomfort, you know, if she wasn't painful, I would leave her alone. Correct. But if she's painful, 
you know, you're going to have to extend her fusion up and you you either got to go to her skull. I would probably try to go to C1. That's why I wanted to see the C1 ring when I could yes. attach it. Yep. Do you, John, do you worry at all when she had her original presentation? She's ankylosed C1. I mean, she's fractured C1, but she's ankylosed it partly to C2. Are you worried a little bit about that healing if you... Well, I, I think if you see an odontoid fracture and somebody has this very rigid C1, C2 arthrosis, mm -hmm. those are more likely to be problematic just because it's a stiff C1, C2 joint. And so it's just, it's a matter of the lever arm. She's pro Is she completely ankylosed or just looks like she's got a lot of arthrosis? She probably doesn't move there much. So yeah. even if she didn't have the fusion below, that's a problem. Yeah. But basically C1... Is, is moving with the skull and I, you know, I, you, you hate to take away all their motions. I'm embarrassed to say I have people that are fused from the skull to their pelvis and you get there slowly over time. Uh, but I would probably still try to, I would probably still try to stop at C1 if I could. And I would put her in a, in a, in a collar for a little while because that's a lot of stress on the C1 screws. We had her in a collar from her initial event. And no, so I mean, if, yeah, if I afterwards. fused her. Oh, if you fuse her. Okay. The, the only thing that's unusual about this case for me is she doesn't look rheumatoid, which is kind of interesting. You guys said she was rheumatoid. I mean, her, her spine looks pretty good. Yeah. Uh, not that that matters or anything. She's got a, you know, she's got a fracture. And I totally agree with John. These do not heal. Mm -hmm. The only thing, if you ever run into this is you get a DEXA study because a good time to give them prolia or something as a bone yeah. agent is not a year later. So, like, if I see these people, I try to get it right away yeah. because the best time to give them any agent to heal a fracture mm -hmm. uh, is, is you know, if you can get an aggressive rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I've sent a lot of these people to endocrinologists because endocrinologists are, tend to be a lot more aggressive. I never do it myself because I can't deal with Medicare. But uh, they tend to be pretty aggressive with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it really comes down to how much pain she has. I... I didn't see flexion extension films. That's the only other thing I'd like yeah, to see. I don't have those. We were having trouble getting her plugged in to get started on therapy for osteoporosis. So she's going to get her first treatment in March. But we're going to address this. Before yeah, I mean, I, I think getting her on osteoporosis treatment is yeah. all very important and all. Yeah. But the reality is it doesn't make so much difference. Like if she's having pain and problems and she's got a long lever arm and that mm -hmm. thing's sitting there, I would not... Like my deformity cases, I'll wait and put them on for t for Teo four to six months to get whatever benefit I can get. But if you do bicortical screws at yep. C1, they're pretty powerful. And I, you know, knock on wood, I've never had any C1 screws fall out. I go bicortical and I tap drill it. I pop it through the front. I use a depth gauge okay. on the front cortex. I, I take the image, I move it left to right, and then I make sure my screw goes right to that point so it does. So I... I Never do bicortical C1 screws. Only because Brad Courier wrote, wrote his paper with the hypoglossal injuries. You see it every now and then. One of my partners got a hypoglossal injury, and the carotid artery is right there. A carotid injury. Uh, you uh, you yeah. worried about carotid. Yeah. You, you can see it. You, you can a, tap a glossal injury. We've never had one. Neither. But we tap drill them. We put a depth gate through, and we were... Let, let me, let me ask Denial is in just a river. Dr. Treadway sitting in the back, the secret weapon, and the next to the last... Bench, as the fellows know, I always pick on the ones in the furthest benches back. C2 to T2 has kind of become a norm for arthritic patients. Can we avoid this kind of event of an odontoid factor by stopping at C3 with equal outcomes? I would say no. <laughs> I mean, if she did fall, we wouldn't have this problem, right? Yes. And uh, so she's almost tectum directum. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is this is a problem when you fuse all these folks. It's the same problem you see with the ankylosing spondylitic patients. I mean, when they're fused up, where are they going to fracture? Probably not where you did the surgery, but the level above or below. So I think this is a nice uh, representation of uh, good good uh, surgical uh, um, um basically good surgery here. Um, we'll see if it's going to fuse. One of the arguments though, when you get these older patients, do you really think they're going to fuse despite what all the bone you put on them? You can put all kinds of different products in them, but when you're 80 and 90 years old, the chance of you fusing is pretty small. So I think we're basically just stabilizing and we put some cool instrumentation in and we hold them into place, but the likelihood of them ever fusing is probably pretty minimal. So not to be a pessimist. Yeah. yeah, but that was many years ago. Else. Yeah, but that was years ago, right? Well, I know, but it, I, I would take a really at crest for this, though. So. 
and I would take an iliac crest and I would take a, a cortical cancellous piece. I used to wire them around the ring, but now all I do is I take a little West Virginia wire, which is like a little bit of suture. How do you spell that? Yeah. <laughs> wire. <Is> that <laughs> yeah. It's W-I-I-R-E. And I, I put a little, and I just suture it down so it stays tight against it. I wrap it around one rod to the next, and I suture it back so it pushes it against. And uh, I, I would take a really at crest 100%, because I think you're right. It's hard to get them to heal, but you got to take their crest. Do you take the nerve root? I always take uh I don't routinely do, but I don't care. If, if it's okay. bleeding a lot and I think I can get rid of the bleeding, I'll take their. I can't hear this. Yes. Okay. So I tell them it's going to hurt a little bit. No, I mean real morbidity. Like no. their pelvis is going to fracture. No, them, no, know? I've never. No. I mean she's osteoporotic already. For 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 since the beginning of spine fusion, we took the iliac crest, and I, I personally, in all my career, we can see if Yen's had have never in the anterior pelvis when we took big chunks for the neck. I've I've seen pelvis fractures. I've never seen a pelvis fracture from a posterior crest graft. Okay. Well, um, I, I would kind of agree with that. Um, when I trained at Rush, we had Dr. Clower that was there as well. And so uh, in the old days, instead of just taking the hip crest, we would actually basically bore out and take the actual cervical graft, right? That was a little bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. And there were some 80-year-olds that we did fracture their hips on, so I haven't taken iliac, uh, anterior iliac crest for a long time. Um, just yesterday, we did a SI joint fusion on a patient that's uh, fused from uh, T10 down to the sacrum and uh, she had lots of bone removed from her left uh, iliac crest and um, it's thinner on that side but but she still has crest left so I agree you can take some crest from the back of her uh, you know from the back of her hip but at the same time I just think that it's going to take a long time for her to fuse so we'll see I just want to really remind everyone just rheumatoid disease was a bad disease yes I, I, I hung out with a guy named Alan Crockard who many probably remember in the, in the room was probably the champion of doing anterior odontoids, and he believed that it was actually an iatrogenic disease due to steroids. So I'm just, I'm doing an infomercial about how bad steroids are before my debate tomorrow. <laughs> but really quickly is rheumatoids, you guys probably don't see that many of them. I still have a couple of line. Scott Bowden wrote a very good paper many years ago. We all concentrated on the ADI, but Scott Bowden actually wrote that if you should check, concentrate on the PDI with these rheumatoid people, mm -hmm. because it's a ligamentous injury. And if you get 15 millimeters in, in the PDI, you can let these people ride without having to fuse them. Got it. All right. Yep. So I'll move to the next one. Oh, um, so like our plan is again uh, to do a posterior revision uh, C1 to, to, to the thoracic fusion. Um, Can I just add? Yes. One, one thing was that she was COPD. So yeah. I don't know how much of a barrel chest she has. But mm -hmm. you had a dentoid screw up there, and that's obviously a bit of a contraindication. I think yes. we're moving away from it. We are. From yeah. a dentoid screw in general. Mm -hmm. it's, it, to me, it's been a poor form of fixation. There are few cases where the fracture morphology aligns so perfectly that yeah. the screw crosses it. And even rarer is fusion across it. You can't get an adequate fusion bed. Okay. So, you know, in these... In elderly patients, I'll accept, I'll accept a fibrous non-union, okay. particularly when uh, their symptoms abate. But otherwise, for me, it's really a posterior Post operation. Yeah. Just because I have that surface area for arthrodesis, yeah. which I don't have with an anterior approach. Gotcha. Thank you for that. All right. So I'll get moving for the next case. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's this is like a contraindication, even in Ron Hafflebaum's hands, to doing an odontoid screw, because he had, he had I mean, all his failures were in patients who were more than three months out. So, I, it, no, 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 it's not going to work. It's never going to work. Also, that ankylosed air, segment, ankylosing C1 to the, the odontoid piece yeah. itself, that's not going to work, and the age is not going to work. All right. So this is our next case um, that we uh, recently had over the last month, the 70 year What are you going to do? Uh, we're going to do a um, C1 revision, uh, posterior revision. C1 to two. C1 to two, yep. All posterior? All posterior. Yeah. Take the crap. <laughs> um, this next case, uh, I don't think Dr. Abdul-Jabbar has joined us yet, but it's one of a uh, patient that he uh, has had. 70-year-old gentleman who uh, we've been following up in outpatient setting, um, had localized pain, um, as well as uh, increased pain when he's uh, getting out of bed, had a prior fall in July. He was in Maine, and at the time, uh, the surgeon did a uh, short segment fusion, um, and he at, also was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis at that moment as well. 
So right now, over the last few months, he's been noticing a worsening of his posture um, and uh, increased pain. Does have a history of muscular dystrophy uh, from childhood. And, uh, and then uh, this is his exam. Had a baseline chronic foot drop since the surgery in July. And then uh, we noted prominence of his hardware at the cephalide portion of the incision. And so just uh, representative images here of uh, the immediate post-op films from his fall in July after the surgeon, neurosurgeon uh, uh, fixed him in uh, July. And so. And then again, just some immediate post-operative changes after the surgical fixation from T11 to L2 uh, for the uh, distracted T12 injury, uh, burst fracture. Um, the initial, um, the initial going through. It was a three-column injury, so this is the B, yeah, B3. <laughs> three-column injury. What kind of injury? Yes, extension fracture, ankle lungs and spine. Yeah. So if, if you were going to fix an ankle or spine, yep. Extension fracture. Mm -hmm. How many levels do you need to do? What What's the one the working principle that you have to do? For me, uh, aim. Yeah, I'll aim. To. You, they went two yeah. above. Yeah, two above. Yes. What's the one working thing you have to do? Is you want long fixation? Long fixation. I mean, two above and two below is not bad. I mean, I, I know I think they're going to be a halo around the screws. Yeah, they do find a microphone because there's people on. There's no haloing around the screws. This is how far out after it is. This is immediate. So, oh, immediate. What, okay. yeah, what we have That's, here. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, to your point. <laughs> So, I mean, it's an ankylosed spine, and two above and two below, if their bone's good, could be okay. I, I like to get three above, three below. I don't always put the middle screw in. Gotcha. But it's long lever arms that you want. It's like yeah. fixing a long bone. But I think you, you want you want a long lever arm to fix it. And this is the subsequent follow-up while we've been in clinic, and we saw him uh, prior. So he was establishing care here in the region in Washington State. Um, he was just traveling from Maine when he had this injury, and the surgeon just fixed him on the spot. Uh, two above and uh, two below. And so, uh, as you can expect, um, now he has uh, worsening um, of his hardware with loosening at the um, superior aspect and then a further wedging at the. One second. So, site. Dr. Kazemi, Arkansas. So, what uh, this is going to be the uh, lead off lecture tomorrow morning. Okay. What is this fracture called in Arkansas? In Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> Well, we, we call it the Arkansas fracture, Jens. So um, it is it is really a uh, fracture, a hyperextension fracture through uh, an angst bond yeah. uh, segment, Beat and me. it's it's highly unstable. He's trying to fuse. You can see that there are uh, various regions where uh, they are trying to fuse, like there, yeah. uh, but it is uh, not stable. Uh, I, I I'm concerned that there's a cord there. And I would revise this. Are we talking about management yet? Uh, we, we will get there. Right. Yeah. Uh, so just go ahead. Memory. Um, again, a gentleman with worsen posture mobility, prominent hardware, worsen pain when he's upright, and then imaging with evidence of some loosening and non union at the prior fracture site. How far, how, how low is it ankylosed? Yes. Again, how, how low down does it go? Go go through the sagittal. Four At the top, you can go as many as you want. It doesn't make any difference. Four levels. I already counted for you. Four levels. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can go four levels below and it has no more, you know, other than the risk of putting a screw through a pedicle, okay. it has no loss of motion, no long-term morbidity for the guy. So worry about the nerve there, big guy, the nerve. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, can, you, can, you can put as many levels in as you want there. Okay to fix him and most of these don't need anterior support. If it fails, like I almost never anterior support these. And you know, the problem is when you put them on the table, you know, particularly if you don't use a Wilson frame, Okay. if you do use a Wilson frame and let them flex, you can close that down. But if you put them on a standard like Trios Jackson bed and they sag, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be an extension. That's not that big of a deal usually. And quite a lot of times they'll settle that down mm -hmm. and they like to heal bone. So a lot of times they'll heal, you know, if you have nice long segments. Okay. So, you know, I, I try not to 
like fix them in extension if I can, but sometimes it's just that's the way they are, and I just leave. I don't worry about it. But now that you've got, if you're, if it's failing, if he stands and it's loose and he's failing, you can either just go four above and four below. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can put a ton of fixation in and get him to heal, and he'll be fine. You you could consider after you did that putting something in through just a little mini anterior incision, putting a little anterior strut in, yeah. only because he's failed. Yeah. I would never do that like with my first case. Would you consider augmentation with your hardware? I, I wouldn't do it the first the first time I fixed him. Okay. But if now I failed mm -hmm. and I need to go back, yeah. I mean I would for sure I would put screws four levels above, four below. I would I would really fix fix him a lot. Yeah. Um that's not necessary in initially either, but I would do that and I would consider putting a, a secondary thing if I could do a little mini incision and just put a little expandable thing in there to make him finish healing. Is there any concern, Cliff, that he's infected? Because is that is that like a soft seroma back there? Th there was because I mean he's, he's really loosened up his screws and stuff. Yeah. yeah, they were cultures taken during the time of surgery. hurt um i guess I, I my my thought would be i i think you're going to still get the guy if you if you lock him in four above and four below you don't need to go in from the front Probably. the one thing i was going to say the, the worst part of this case is positioning yeah and so the only time i use a wilson frame is this case and the second thing is get ready because when you position him his head is going to be hitting the floor because these guys typically are so kyphotic in their necks and that's what you got to worry about because I've seen patients break their neck as people try the anesthesia, people try to keep their head from hitting the ground. So be very careful with, with like of all the things, the surgery is nothing. Once you get them positioned, yeah. I, I, I worry mostly about positioning this guy. Don't, don't put them on a face rest. Okay. You got to look and I put them in a Mayfield head holder and then I put their head and I just bring it up and match their head and it's off and, you and do way like down. Maximum. Reverse and Ellenberg, yeah. and they're still like they get forehead skids. Mm -hmm. You were you were there, Brian, right? I just add to that you have to talk about the neck. Right you should always uh, image the entire spine with a CT and or MRI scan to look for non contiguous mm -hmm. fractures. I hope that was done here. And again, the the other thing is respiratory function. These patients is very limited. So MIS, the rage, right? The industry rage and everything. I'm talking to my MIS cognoscenti. This is perfect for MIS, right? Trent, MIS, you have a microphone in front of you. You're an MIS king. You're an early adopter. <laughs> yeah, I was forced to do it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's a Stockholm syndrome. It, uh, I still like minimally invasive. It's very good, but not, not with an ankylosing spondylitis. You're, you're going to be in trouble all day long. Um, it's interesting that we heard the, the three above, three below, because we've always been taught two above, two below. Um, if you get good fixation, you get a good fusion across there. Obviously, given this person enough time, they may, may have fused, but... There's just going to be too much movement at this level, and that's where you're going to get into trouble. So, um, it's now this is the interop films here. So, yeah, how far did you go? You go did you go three above, three below? Yeah, this we went one? T9 to L3. Sure. And then uh, we did uh, provide anterior, uh, anterior column support. As and well. uh, that looks like a, a great implant there that's going to going to fuse very well. Yeah. You know, uh, the problem of it is is uh, is the fusion on these patients. But they, they fuse so well, you would think that they would fuse all the time, right? Yeah. But not necessarily the case. Um, the, I don't do a whole lot of cement um, because I don't think it's all that helpful. And, and if you ever do have an infection like they brought up, now you've got infected cement and that's a real pain in the butt, uh, no pun intended. Uh, so uh, so we'll, we'll see how this person does, but yeah. I, it does look a little bit interesting that there, there's a lot of, um, th there could possibly be some uh, uh, infection there that's uh, a low indolent. Um, and did, and did you guys swab the area? We did swab okay. in culture. So. And were any of the markers, ESR, CRPs, anything elevated? They on were all stable. It's all okay. so far. And, and, saying, but, you know, I think it was a good idea. Did you put your graft in from the back? Yeah. You, put it, you, you put it in from the back? Yes. We did. Or did you an anterior approach? So th this is the, the problem is, is that you need a pretty tall graft mm -hmm. and it's going to mash into the end plates. I don't, I don't care how well you put it in and it mashed into your inferior end plate. The, the problem is when you're putting in the front, because it's an extension thing, the gap to get it in from the back is smaller than what you need in the front. Yeah. And there's no way to get a tall enough graft in from the back in the front. And so I, I probably would have, 
I, I you know, I would have probably done something similar post year. I might have gone four, three, fine, if, particularly if you're planning. And then I would have done a mini thing and just put a little expandable thing and jacked it open okay. until it just seemed tight. I don't care if it mashes into the end plate. But like right now, your anterior graft, if you go through your sag, it's not really doing much to help you, but it's hard to get it in like that. It's hard to get a big enough cage. I, I totally agree. I think, you know, we, we're really good now with getting anterior access and putting in something from the front. And if it can cover that gap, wonderful. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's gonna fuse anyway. Mm -hmm. Two other points, there, there wasn't haloing of the screws when you see it, infection, 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 infection. Yes. You got to swab it, you did it, that's great. The, the other point is neuromonitoring. Yes, Get baseline neuromonitoring before you flip. It's so important, these patients. A little bit of movement there uh, compromises the cord. Uh, you need to know about it and you, you reverse what's done. But it's important to document that, um, yeah. For our lateral surgery, is that an option here in an angst bond patient? Why not? I, mean, I don't think that, it, your, your goal is arthrodesis with maximal surface area, right? So if you're gonna go to the extent of far lateral, just go lateral, just go anterior approach. Jim's about to disagree with me. <laughs> well, I'm actually gonna tell you that I've done a bunch of these and the problem is what? And, and, and yet you said it, they have restricted lung disease. Yeah. The reason they have restricted lung disease is not because they have pulmonary problems is because their ribs fuse together. Yeah. And so when you're trying to do this, it's a, I can't swear because it'll get bleeped <laughs> out, but it, I mean, it's really tough operation. Yes. And it looks like an alien when you get in there. And I mean, I agree with John, if you're gonna put a graft, I usually do put something. I try not to on the ankle losing spondylitis. The only trick I will say is if I'm gonna do it, I'm worried about it, that person, I would put a single rod in the front too which I actually will put them right through the disc space because it's the only cortical bone on these people. Okay. It's the weirdest It's the weirdest disease in the world. I mean, they have no cortical. If you go into the body, it's all osteoporotic bone, but if you go right through the disc space, yeah. you, you angle it through. So I think you have bring, bring a great point. We talk about these ankylosing spondylitics and we look at them like, man, there's this solid, it's hard bone all the way down. If you take all this instrumentation out and you don't look at the ankylosing spondylitis, this person's osteoporotic and that's the real issue here. So no matter what you're gonna put in, it's still an osteoporotic patient, right? Yeah. So the other thing too, I gotta ask about because nobody else loves it. I love cross links, right? Cause cross links rock because I may or may not have had a patient wake up on the table at one point in time during my fellowship and the patient was waking up because they ran out of the Michael Jackson juice, also known as propofol. And as they moved, they did this and it's a windshield washer, right? So cross links are your friend. I always will cross link right below the top, right above the bottom. And I put a couple in there in between. That's my favorite thing. Other people are like, oh, look, it's going to break the rod. Well, yeah, sometimes you go in there and you see that the rod broke right where you put the cross link in, but you can't see it on the CT scan. So the important part of it is rotation is important. The person that's moving around, use some cross links, okay? By the way, yeah, so where we got our debate next year? Cross links, useless or not? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh, wait. And if, you, if somebody says a kickstand rod, I'm going to take you outside. No, no, no. Going out. Kickstand <laughs> rod. That should be but, uh, disallowed. But, but you're a believer of, of, of extra stabilization, right? Why not add an extra <laughs> no. rod or two? No. These, these no. The only time we ever did quad rods was when, it, when, it, when sacral tumors. Don't you, don't need quad, you don't need quad rods. I don't think you need a quad rod for this. this is a, these guys got a bone-making problem. Yeah. I mean, if you hold them in place, they, they fuse like gangbusters. So I want to just uh, ask uh, Dr. Lewitt. Garrett is one of our fellows. He did a very nice project on far lateral surgeries, T12 corpectomies, full corpectomies with a far lateral approach. And uh, this is not an ankylosing model that you had. But if you can try to transfer it, first of all, give a couple of the highlights of the surprises of doing a complete T12 corpectomy in a far lateral approach. What structures were at risk? What did you actually find being violated or not in your cadaver study? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Um, yeah, um, we performed a, a cadaver study of uh, six cadavers and performed a T12 copectomy and cage implantation uh, via a far lateral approach, always via the, the left side. And what we really wanted to look at is um, to, to qualitatively and quantitatively uh, measure which structures are at risk and also um, measure the, the distances of the surgical route to the uh, corresponding um, structures. So what we performed uh, is the, the one, the first um, part was the regular T12 copectomy and cage implantation. Afterwards, we flipped the patient around into a supine position and performed a 
yeah, big um, um, media uh, stenotomy and laparotomy to kind of open it up, really like a very big surgery to really have a look, okay, which structures did we injure, or hopefully not, and which structures uh, are at risk in this, in this procedure. And we specifically looked at Obviously, the parietal pleura, um, the aorta, um, the vena cava, the, the segmental veins, uh, the diaphragm, et cetera. And um, what we found out, we we're about to publish it, so I think I'm, I'm good to, uh, to tell. What is, um, first of all, pretty surprising is we didn't have any um, diaphragm injuries in all of our cadavers, um, although it was the level of T12. Um, that was pretty surprising. Uh, moreover, we still had a safety distance of at least 3.5 centimeters to the diaphragm. Um, so maybe even like an L1 corpectomy could have been possible, which was pretty surprising because in literature it's ex actually um, explained that um, the diaphragm attaches at the vertebral spine um, a lot higher, so in the thoracolumbar junction, but sometimes even at, at T11, T12. That was quite compelling, always with the limitation, obviously, that we're dealing with cadavers. Um, and moreover, um, we, we didn't have any vascular injuries, but the distances to the aorta, for example, in, in one case, was only seven millimeters. So sometimes it's pretty close, although we felt pretty safe during the procedure. Um, yeah, it can get pretty close. That sounds pretty interesting, but I would like to add, <clears throat> in those cadavers, how many of them were breathing with the diaphragm moving up and down, and how many of those vessels were filled with blood? None. So that's where it's a little bit tricky yeah. because when you get in the operating room and even just most injuries are not going to occur from what you're doing, yeah. it's the retractors, it's, it's the approach, right? Yeah. So, you know, they're cadavers, so you got to be careful with Absolutely. that. Now, if you want to fill them up with a little bit of fluid, and, mm -hmm. and, and that may be a little bit different because they're going to be compressed. So. Yeah. Also considering that you have the positive. Not that I'm a pessimist. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what an interesting study and um, long overdue. So um, as somebody who likes to do this through a minimally invasive pathway, mm -hmm. I concur with your findings. I really don't need to find that I need to uh, reapproximate the, diaph the diaphragm. Um, and I would take a left-sided approach as well. It's, it's advantageous for the vessels and so on. Um, the biggest thing for me has actually been... Uh, you know, between T11 to L1 is the difficult period uh, or area because I try to connect the retropleural uh, to the retroperitoneal space. And once you do that, everything falls forward and you can get onto it. The mm -hmm. biggest danger for me has been the segmental vessels. So if you divide a segmental vessel, as Trent says, they want to like run away from you, especially the proximal part closer to the aorta. You need to control it. You can lose a lot of blood from segmental vessel um, injury, and or, or just not injury, but just division of the vessels or moving them around in order to do your corpectomy. Tomorrow we'll see that being done uh, prone lateral, which is kind of fun. Um, but thank you. That's a really good study. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's move forward. So Brian Anderson has, I think, two cases, and we can yeah, fly through one of them rapidly. We've had a couple interesting cases. So the first one is the 76-year-old female that came to us a month after she had a ground-level fall uh, in her bathroom. She had some neck pain afterwards. She was initially seen in an outside hospital and uh, diagnosed with a type 2 odontoid and Jefferson 3. Uh, they were non-displaced. She was put in an aspen collar, and then she showed up to um, our clinic about a month later. Um, she's got no prior history of any uh, neck pain or neck trauma or neck surgery. Her neuro exam was um, pretty benign. She had intact bowel and bladder. Um, medical history was significant over, only for hypertension. And you can see her uh, chart over here uh, demonstrating a, a normal exam. Here were her x-rays, just an AP lateral and open mouth, um, showing no real displacement of the fractures, um, no lateral mass translation. And then here's a CT. Um, you can see that. Let's see if I can. So, Dr. Harrop, uh, I think you co authored one of the many papers, but uh, the connection or combination injury of a type 2 odontoid, which this still is, and a C1 ring, even if it's not very significantly displaced, does that just predispose this patient to a far worse outcome than the already bad or poor outcome? from a type 2 odontoid fracture? Oh, what did I, what did I say in my paper? I don't remember. <laughs> too many papers. That's it's too many papers. Harm when you're in the 400 you range. didn't write it, Jim. I didn't write it. It's probably, it probably was a good paper if I didn't write it. 
I mean, this lady's kind of interesting. If you look at her, she's ankylosed her two, three, three joint. She's got more than just a simple fracture. She's got almost where a lot of her mass is off. Can you see the backside of her C1 ring on the other side? How, how far out is she from her fall? A month. A month? How's she doing? She's doing really well. Yeah, she has a little bit of a neck pain, more so on the left side, but she said that her pain's actually improved 80%. Yeah, the, the guys pain. up the street would probably try to put a lateral a C1 screw and squeeze their C1 together. I would ignore her. I mean, I, I'd keep her in a collar and I'd watch her and I'd, I'd see her back in six weeks and see how she's doing. Yeah, that's pretty much what we, what we did. Um, she elected- Now you're gonna see her head fall off. Let's go. Let's see here. So uh, we elected to proceed with non-op uh, treatment. We just continued the collar and we saw her back in six weeks with a repeat CT. Uh, repeat CT is, see if I can play it here. She has a little bit of um, extension uh, at her C2 fracture, um, some gapping there with some osteolysis at the fracture site. Uh, her uh, C1 ring fracture is showing some signs of healing um, without any uh, diastasis. Uh, Why'd you get a CT six weeks out? So my question, how's she doing at this point? When we saw her the first time, she but said that she's time. 80% better than at the time of injury. Yeah. And at this point, six weeks after we saw her yeah. the first time, she's saying that she's having increased pain on the left side of her head towards her ear, like C2, grad occipital nerve. You know, I, I might CT her under that circumstance, but I never CT these. Like, I don't, I don't want to know because most of the, most of them are non-unions. Okay. I think like if you read papers when it says it's 20, 30 percent, that's not true. It's 70, 80 percent. Yeah. And so I don't CT them if they're comfortable with, you know, if they're having a lot of pain, then you and you need to have a discussion. But I find it's very rare for pain to drive me to surgery. But if they're having a lot of pain and I'm looking, I'm, I'm probably going to CT him to look. But I don't look routinely. Let me just give you, yes, yeah, here's the paper I do remember writing. We looked at hangman's fractures. Yeah. And you know. everyone in the group ignored them and they did great. We had a 100% fusion rate, <laughs> except for one clown who, what'd they do? They got a CAT scan in six to eight weeks. Every radiologist read it as non union. And he operated on every one of those patients. So if the patient's doing well, there's two rules. If you get an epidural abscess, follow their, follow their labs and never get an MRI on them. And CAT scans, unless you, it's a problem because now you're looking at a CAT scan, the, the lady's bright. The, the Radiographically, they, they lag way behind clinically. Yes. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter if they heal. The vast, 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 vast majority of them don't have enough pain to operate on. And that's obviously there's going to be somebody that's going to have enough pain to operate on. But if you look at the data, you know, in, in my experience is, is I don't think I've ever gone back and operated on a dontoid non-union for pain. So it'll go away eventually. I might just, I, even at this point, her husband's bright, she's bright. I might have a conversation and say, look, it's probably not healed. It probably will never heal. If your pain goes away enough that you're happy, We'll watch you forever. We never have to do anything. Um, if the pain's incapacitating, then obviously it can have a surgical discussion. Right. I don't know, John. I'm really suspect, though, because she had no pain for a period of time and then started getting pain. And that, to me, is poor tense. Yeah, that, that was my question. What about doing just plain old flexion extension x-rays to, to prove that she's got a mobile non-union as opposed to a fibrous non-union? Yeah, the, those were not performed. It was just a CT at the six. But below. even mobile non-unions can be asymptomatic. Yeah, but so, she's so, not. So, yeah, John. Well, I, know, I know, I know. But I when mean, do we I call an odontoid? I have yet to operate on an elderly patient of mine with an odontoid non-union for pain. John, when do we call a non-union in an adult or an elderly I just, adult? I call all the elderly patients non-union. Okay. Just want to say it doesn't. I mean, they're all. Like, I'm trying to if you CT them, it's 70, 80 percent. I mean, I think the papers that say that are probably correct. I flex and extend. What I do, what I typically do, is I leave them in a collar for three weeks. I get an X-ray at three weeks. If they're reasonably comfortable, I take them out of the collar. I don't flex and extend them then because they're stiff. And I tell them, come back in a month, flex and extend them. Even if I see some motion, if they're asymptomatic, I leave them alone. If I don't see motion, I say, okay, this might be fused. It might be just kind of a fibrous, stiff non-union. And I'll see them at the six-month point, flex and extend them again and watch them. And I watch them for a year or two with flexion extensions after that. And if they become symptomatic, I'll, I'll see TM and talk about surgery, but. John, only because I'm a neurosurgeon and I don't understand the complexity of bone healing, 
So what do you think's happened by three weeks? What do you mean three weeks? I mean, why your your attitude is that keep her in a collar for three weeks? Three, no, her. three months. Oh, three months. Three months. If I said weeks, I meant three months. Yeah. I keep her in a collar for three months. I don't flex or extend her when I take them out. I just take them out at three months, and then I flex and extend them at four months. Do you think the fact that she's ankylotic throughout her whole spine really? It's like that first. It's like that first case we saw. I, I just don't think she's going to do that well. I don't think she's mysterious. Going to the only ones, and I'll show one tomorrow that I've gone back and dealt with are ones that are either fused, like the first one, or if she is, if that truly is ankylosed there, I'd have to see on the sagittals. Then it might make her symptomatic. That that might be someone who who you would end up doing. That's a different situation. All right, Brian, what's happened? She's clearly ankylosed at 2-3. All right, so summary, 10 weeks out from a ground level fall. Um, she's a little displaced in extension. She's got delayed union uh, or non-union, if you want. And then um, she's got some healing at the Jefferson. And uh, she has no neurologic deficit. She just has this pain. Can, can I go back only because I'm a stickler for classifications? I've never heard of a type 3 Jefferson. So Jefferson is a very specific fracture identified by a pathologist a million years ago, Okay, which is a four-part fracture. There's four fractures in the C1 ring. And so I've never heard of a type 3 Jefferson, not to pick on you. It would be no, it's fine. C1 ring. We could go with a type 3 C1 ring. I'm just asking what classification system. I was just trying to get some knowledge. So her... So I've, I've looked through these CT scans pretty thoroughly, and the only violation of the ring was right here and right here. And right. so I said it was anterior break, posterior. They break a pretzel in one place, so they always have two rings. They usually almost always have an even number of fractures. Yeah, there's just two fractures in this ring. Well, I can go right, I'll up next. So we've got some treatment options, um, and we can cut to the chase, but uh, we could continue with non-operative treatment like you suggested. Uh, we could go from the front and try to fix the odontoid. We could just fuse her from the back, or we could do a combined procedure. I think the concept of shared decision-making is, is a real thing, but it's a little bit bogus at times. But this is, you know, her husband's an anesthesiologist. You can do some good shared decision making here, yeah. and you you have options to fix it or treat it non-op. I mean, I think a lot of times we pretend shared decision making to try to absolve ourselves of responsibility, which it shouldn't be. But you can you can sit down with them. They're bright. You know, he's been in in yeah. surgery, so this is a nice opportunity to be able to make a decision with you know her and her husband. Yeah. <clears throat> Fire ahead. All right. So this is what we did. Um, we did a C12 open reduction internal fixation, a fusion of one to three, and an instrumented one to three, and then bilaterally we did a C2 neurotomy. Otherwise, the the procedure was uncomplicated. Um, she did pretty well. This is just a X-ray postoperatively. I think it may be a two or a six week, a two week visit. Um, these are X-rays, I believe, from two months out. Um, well, see, the only reason it worked is because of that cross connector. You saved her life. <laughs> <laughs> Love that cross connector. That cross connector is beautiful. But why take the seat? So for me, the, we're neurosurgeons. We leave those nerve roots. You go right through. You know, this is now. this is uh, the usual argument that we have. Uh, where Dr. Data sits this is where Dr. Screen sits. And here's an orthopedic surgeon on this side. I'm the nerve root preserver. He's the cutter. It, it shocks me. It shocks me. And obviously, well, why does it, so what is the what was the rationale? Was it to arthrodesis C12 joint? I knew that. But yeah. yeah, her her pain was predominantly in that great occipital nerve. Okay. Yeah, and you took it like with that neurotomy, pain. right? When you took the nerve root, her pain's gone. Now she got a numb head. Yeah, yeah. Get so confused. So here's the thing. I mean, her, her pain's coming from the C2 nerve root, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's, there, there is some, a little bit of motion. It's not there anymore. <laughs> but that CSF leak it's, is. <laughs> it's just numb uh, now, um, a, a numb neuropathy. No, but, uh, you know, in, in these cases, um, you can keep them in a collar because it's very difficult to eat or just get on. Right. And then she's at 10 weeks. So you need to do something. So you either do this or you decide to remove the collar yeah. and treat the C2 nerve uh, through whatever 
way you want, for example, an injection, so on. I, I'm, I'm saying that could have been a potential form of treatment where you did C2 or greater occipital nerve injections um, and treat her symptomatically and not put, you know, put her through this. Now, I'm sure she's going to do great and she's got a, a very informed and knowledgeable family, um, you know, and she's a, probably a smart individual. But I worry uh, in general for elderly people uh, having this operation. Um, you know, I just think, you know, maybe an idea to take the collar off and, and follow them and treat the pain symptomatically. Right. Can you show that CT scan um, yeah. one more time just to see? Pre-op? Yeah, just the pre-op because once again, there's been a number of publications that um, have been out that you can actually go through the C1 lamina and uh, it's actually really nice. You don't have to get in. You don't get near the vertebral uh, artery. You don't get near the, uh, the vessels. You don't need to get near the veins. And you don't have to take the C2 nerve root. So you could probably have gone through the, the lamina and just uh, do the actual C1 screw there in the harms construct, if you will. Uh, on, the, on the axial over there, if you can just kind of scroll through that. Yeah, sure. She is 76 years old, so why not? Because you really have taken care of her pain because you took the C2 nerve root. But uh, the fusion, you know, it, looks, it looks like a great construct, but She's away from I would have left him in a collar forever. So we have an independent new opinion here. He's oh. taking a swig of uh, double rye. Dr. Wood has just arrived. So <clears throat> we live in a pretty neurotic area of the country, and I sense a certain um, kind of a trend uh, like West Virginia and Arkansas, so people are okay with uh, running around with a non-union. And I'm not sure how it is in Stanford and Palo Alto. So if you have a 76-year-old, uh, very engaged, socially aware person, how does that uh, work for them to have a radiologist write repetitively odontoid non-union? Um, well, I'm halfway into this thing. Uh, they're very uh, aware. They're very involved. I, I simply would say, and um, it depends. I, I mean, I really can't answer that that question. The, there's a wide range of uh, people down there. And can they can they live with the fact that they have an odontoid non-union? Or well, I mean, will, will that I, make I, I am. A, you read the reports, not. I am a complete nihilist when it comes to the odontoid fractures. I. I, in my, all these years, I, maybe one or two, I mean, but certainly once you're over a certain age, I, I don't think I've operated. And that goes for hangman's fractures too, yeah. that aren't too wildly displaced. I mean, it, when they get older, it just I think the pain mechanisms are different than when you're 37. And I can't back that up with any real science. But well, there experience. are lower energy injuries too. Oh yeah, but I mean, and their their needs and their their wants and their whatever what they're asking for of their spine is different than when you're younger. I just want to go back to the C two nerve because I think it's it's a very interesting nerve, and we don't talk about this enough. You have a nerve with an injury, and we cut it, and it gets better. No other nerve in your body, if someone has neuropathic pain, would you say, John? Like after your typical L five S one disc disc they have neuropathic pain in their left leg pain. And, and so you don't go oh i'm gonna go cut the, I'm gonna, yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna go cut the s1 your s1 nerve it's just a, it's a different nerve that, that's what i'm trying to get out to the rest of the room and to the to the younger people it's a totally different world they tend to do very i never took it forever and then one day i said i'm gonna try taking it but like <laughs> it makes the operation so it's like putting a chest tube. I mean, it's putting a central line in with someone with like a chest tube because you're staring at the whole lateral mass. The facet's right there. You can pack it. It's it's an easy operation. And the patients didn't have the whole numb head. It's just a very interesting nerve, and I haven't figured it out. There's a couple of randomized studies where they cut one side versus the other one, and they didn't have the allodynia or the balding that people talk about. The, the interesting thing is it's big. Oh, it's huge. Too. So when you cut it, you're like, man, that damn thing's big. Like you would think it would be important if and it was that It's thing. not as big as it, but you're, you're actually cool. cutting the DRG. You're not really cutting the actual right. nerve root. Right. So from a neurosurgical standpoint, stay the hell away from it, okay? So <laughs> I don't, don't cut the nerve roots. Don't cut any nerve roots. That's a bad thing, okay? <laughs> Maybe if you're going to section it, if you're doing some trigeminal neurology. That's a different story. But stay away. Don't take nerve roots. Bad thing. Well, you, I guess you don't want to cut it pre-ganglionic because that's where you're going to see it. I mean, but what's worse, cutting it or moving it craniocaudally 
you know, I used to always pull it down and just pull it with my suction. Right. And, and I, I just yeah. go through the lamina. When you're trying to cut it, how do you deal with the flex? So if you... Wait, here, we can't hear you. Neil, we can't hear you. Once you cut it, you can turn the bobie up to like 7,000. <laughs> Help there. <laughs> the Bobby oftentimes goes through the venous plexus. Exactly. That's not necessarily a great solution. I mean, Flo still made this Brian, operation. What's next? All right, I got another one. This one's a little bit quicker. Second. All right, I got a 25 year old female. She's a status post a 12 foot fall on, directly under her back while she was bouldering in a gym. Uh, she had severe mid back pain when she was seen in the ED, no abdominal pain. She's got no history of back stuff. Uh, she's neurologically intact, similar to our last patient. She does have some crepitus over T10, T11, um, and some significant pain in that area. Uh, this is her imaging. I think this is, just, oh, here we go. This is a, a sagittal CT and a T2 MR. Let's scrolls through real quick. You can see there's, no real neural compromise on the right on our MRI, uh, but you can see a burst fracture of T11. And then... Kirk, help him out. And at T10, she has a B2 injury. So combined, it's a, it's a flexion distraction injury. Correct. I don't know what she landed on. She fell. Yeah, bouldering. Dude, that's an interesting injury. So B3 at 11, uh, I'm sorry, A3 at 11 and a B2 at T10. Um, but she has no neurologic deficits and she's got a negative abdominal exam and CT scan. So um, given the lack of neurologic deficits, uh, you may be tempted to treat her with non-operative treatment uh, with a brace. But given that it's a three-column injury um, and unstable, maybe tempted to treat her with surgery. We could do short segment fusion, decompression, or long segment fusion. You can do everything from the back. All right, so aside from the fact that this is a leading contender for nightmare uh, from hell first dates in 2023, this is their first date, this, this young lady and uh, the young gentleman who took out, uh, they went bouldering, and so she crashed on her date. So. So that was kind of. Is she still with him? Huh? Is she still with no. him? No. Okay. That was, yeah. She, that's, that's a that's a good move on her part. So so we have this thing that she is a very intelligent. Immediately on the phone, ever whatever you say is on uh, mirrored in Doctor Google. Um, so uh, she wants to have the best treatment. She's a very engaged. She's a computer programmer, has a steep career in front of her, and it's going to be more selective in her date um, uh, uh, screening in the future. Uh, so what do we do with her now? So she has this two-level injury. Do we have an MRI, Brian? Yeah, there was an MRI. Yeah, it there was an MRI. MRI yeah. it, it's a type B injury. It's a. It's a. Yeah, I, I think non-operative treatment. If you non-op this, it's going to kyphose pretty significantly and be problematic. I, I don't think in a young, healthy patient, non-operative is an issue. Is is on on the table for this, and I don't think you need long segment fusion. And I think you can do this short segment, one above, one below. You can put little short screws at the level of the fracture if you, you want. Can, you can only pick one and, answer. I mean, you've gone through that. Right. <laughs> well, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm getting to that. So I would do surgical number one, and I would not decompress it. You can, by decompressing people, you cannot impart superpowers. So if they are <laughs> neurologically intact, there is what no value You have to be compressed decompress. to decompress. So there's no decompression. It's You could do it if you're a perker. You could perk this. For me, at that level, there's no value in not fusing it. I can fuse it. It's got long-term stability. I'm going to do one above, one below. The loss of motion there it has no morbidity do. associated okay. with it. That's an hour and a half operation. You can't perk it faster. I'm going to open it, fuse it, and I'm not going to... Not to be on short say, segments. I was going to say this is the perfect operation for when you don't need an operation, which to me is a minimally invasive case. So, I mean, you could do a perk case on this. You could do it. There's hematoma. Kirk, surgery. Press that. There's no. I, I didn't you can't make really, somebody neurologically better than intact. You never can do it. It can't, can't be. I don't have a problem putting her, putting her in a brace either. She's a skinny girl. She's pretty yeah. She's 20. Never seen someone that's the, the problem is if you brace her and she loses follow up, the operation changes. Right now, the operation's easy. 
In six weeks, the operation's hard. We have phones around here. People are all right. We're not in the cow towns. Okay, we're all right. Hey, Kirk. No, I'm, I miss, maybe I missed on the MRI, but what ligaments are torn? Going back. Go yeah. bilateral facet fractures. What's that? Go bilateral facet fractures is what I saw. She does. At, at the level above. And there's a a broken spinous process. Yeah, yeah. The And there's a little chip on the facet. Keep on going, that's it. Do, do you have an story. axial CT or not? Or okay, what is the, I didn't put an axial in. Okay, right. This was the best bang for our buck. I don't have a problem putting an abrasion. Me neither. And and here's the other thing: there is increasing evidence that shows that a TLSO brace does nothing. A, a brace will do nothing. She's a young person. She's going to fuse. Let her fail. Let her fail. And then if it, and then if she fails, she will kyphose. The, these the, practice in our country, the, right? these these yeah. practices. Arkansas and West Virginia do not have the tech, the tech the industry. Reason, the reason why I'm saying this is because there's been an evolution. I would be the guy that would fuse this. Okay, that was a I, B3 fractures. Right. This is a B3 it is a B fracture, but I still think that I wouldn't put her in a TLSO. I'd put her in some kind of smaller, um, you know, brace like maybe a corset. I'd give her time. And if she if she fails, then we can come back and then we can fix her. So 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 why even brace her then? I mean, so so fo follow up for me. A failure for me would be pain marked by pain. A kyphosis. Uh, I would want to image her with uh, plain imaging. I'd bring her back. His fellowship has been revoked. <laughs> but but you know I I think that we see these people. They do kyphos, um, and that's okay as long as it's asymptomatic and it's within. It, it, it's not leading to 35 degrees of kyphosis is what she'll end up in. Small no. Your moment arm is just above at the top edge of that thing, and then it will have more of a chance of falling over. So I'd either do a total TLSO or nothing. Uh, so the, the, the external brace reflects what we do internally. So, so if, you're, if you're doing a TLSO, which covers her from... Thoracic, high thoracic to L3 basically covers that region there. Effectively, you're trying to do a long construct fixation, but with an external brace. So if you don't believe that that's what's necessary, then why do you believe that a short segment fusion or fixation? Two randomized prospective studies. The data is clear. TSO braces do zero to prevent deformity. Zero. Nothing. No effect at all whatsoever. And in fact, pain control, nothing. Yeah. And so I, I haven't braced a spine fracture in 20 years. In 20 years, yes. Yeah. I have both references because I'm, I'm an author on one of them. I know. I want to know what they are. Yeah. So <laughs> both of them. And I haven't braced a spine fracture in 20 years. If I'm going to treat them non-op, I just let them get up and yeah. go. If I think they're not going to do, and I'll follow them. If they do fail early in a week or two, I'll fix them. It's the same operation. But if you try to fix them at six weeks, it's a different operation. So this young patient, a one-hour open operation, you just do a short segment fusion. There's no morbidity. She goes back to normal. I mean, I, I would fix her short. I'm going to put this young colleague who's uh, interviewing here for a fellowship who's from New Jersey on the spot. What argument sways you more? You heard the story. This is a beautiful young computer operator um, fell on a first date as a flexion. Beautiful tattoo on her back. She doesn't want to cut. And back. she's neurologically intact. Fortunately, she has no other injuries. You heard arguments for let's let it be a nihilism or nihilism, however you want to pronounce it. Um, uh, extensive bracing may or may not work, or some form of surgery. What's your thought? I like the short segment fusion option. If it were me, if it were myself. I mean, I think I like the option too. One because I think brace. You applying now? Because we have a spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Matt Mead. I'm a fourth year from Jefferson, New Jersey. Um, if this were me, I think personally, I don't know that I would tolerate the brace well, especially if there's literature support that it doesn't give really? much pain so, relief. I gotta argue with you because a you're from my school and you have so you haven't learned anything. So <laughs> let's just go back for a second. He's quoting the wrong paper, which I'm not even sure you can read. But let's go go through is this is a different fracture in a different location. And this is a 11 fracture, and Kirk is totally right. If you're going to put an embrace person, this is the fracture you want and the location you want in a skinny person. So to me, I'm not a huge brace person, but I'm like, and 
I'm not looking at that fracture being like, oh my God, that's the worst fracture I've ever seen in my life. She's got little chip fractures on her facets. And if it was a chance fracture, what would we do? I mean, all the Canadians would put them in a hyperextension brace. Do you read those papers? <laughs> they do terrible. Care. Okay. No, I, I think there was a day. There was a day when we would take a patient, even with a burst I know, fracture. I know you get lo less our views with the brace. Even, even with the a burst fracture, there was a day we would take them either the OR or we'd put them between two exam tables. We would hyperextend them or with a wrist or table. Yep, yep. We would cast mold them, cut the cast off, and a custom TLSA would be made from that cast and it would fit them perfectly. That is not the brace you get today. Okay, another the voice of reason today are the like back a girl. Tell us who you are and what your thoughts are. Hi, I'm Zoya Veronovich. I graduated from OU in uh, 21 from neurosurgery residency. I'm about to do some locums work in a couple of months at Creighton. In having seen this before in like my hospital-based practice, I think I would recommend a short segment fusion for her. I think part of it is in terms of shared decision making. If you tell a 25-year-old who's active that she's at significant risk of kyphosis, I know I would go for the surgical option as her. I think there's also a cosmesis thought there for her especially. Great points. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Trent? Yeah, uh, I think there's a couple things here. <clears throat> Number one, superheroes. Um, Dr. Strange was a neurosurgeon, not an orthopedic surgeon. Just want to tell you that. Um, number two, this person needs a brace, and that's all they need. You put them in a brace, and you watch them for three months, six months. COVID has been very interesting because a lot of people get compression fractures, even burst fractures. <clears throat> they come into the emergency room. Nobody gets called. Nobody gets seen. They don't put them in a brace, and then they come back to you, and they're kyphotic. This person probably needs a brace. I would come back and have them come back to me in six months, six weeks, three months. Wouldn't get another X-ray till three months to six months. If it's worse, than you do the surgery. She doesn't need surgery right now. The axial CT is going to be real important because it's not necessarily a chance fracture, but you look at the disc. The disc looks good on the MRI. The fractures up above the compression fracture. I'm not worried about it at all. So. Brace, but watch them very closely because the last thing you want them to do is to go up and fall over and then you're in trouble. <clears throat> TLSO. Absolutely. Okay, Brian, what do we do? Drum roll. Or a corset that you're wearing right now. We gave the patient the option. We talked about bracing and we talked about short segment fusion. She chose the fusion. Overnight, she was calm. She was collected. She went online. She went to wash you with a major wound infection. <laughs> the follow up. <laughs> Why are you allowing the patient to choose the surgery? No, I'm just kidding. Shared decision making. Your screws in the connection. Informed consent. There's a cross links. So, yeah, I know. We failed. Uh, we forgot something. So, this is her two months uh, post op and um, no loss of, um, of alignment. And then this is her at 15 months post op as well. So, she did have preservation of her spinal alignment and she was back to doing all the activities that she wanted to do. Um, very athletic things, and she had no neurologic deficits. She was quite happy. The thing about fusions here, one, they're just <laughs> there. Morbidity, the loss of motion to her is zero. She won't notice it. And, it, and it, the loss of motion to her clinically, she won't notice it. And adjacent segment disease from this is is unheard of. It's yeah. not like lumbar fusions where you worry about adjacent disease. These people don't don't get adjacent segment disease. Dr. Wood brings up a good point. The uh, the pre-lordotic rods that are sticking out of her back, she's, she's definitely feeling like that's that. not a cosmetic issue right now. Yeah. Why did you? Those may have no That's it. Thank you. Yes. It's a rough crowd. How fast did you let her return to activities? And what were your thoughts on activity restriction for her? Literally, we let her back to everything by three months, and she was uh, doing light aerobics by three weeks. So uh, non or low impact, artificial 30-pound restriction. Okay, Neil Patel. Thank you, Brian. All right. I have a Ford versus Ferrari kind of case. Um, so there's a gentleman, 71-year-old, who uh, races uh, vintage cars for hobby, uh, presented with a rollover motor uh, vehicle accident. 
Um, he presented with this C67 facet, jump facets. And he presented to us later, so I only have this image as a pre-op image for him. And I have, he also had a T5 compression fracture, which, which has been taken from a post-op image, but you just assume that there's, there, there's a compression fracture there as well. What's the screw? They just, is that in Seattle, people just have screws in their back? He said that he is, post -op. Yeah. He just showed yeah. me that that was there. Because <clears throat> didn't, he didn't present to us till later. Somebody else This happened in a neighboring state, yeah. <clears throat> a high stakes vintage car race. That video so, one year after uh, his uh, motor uh, vehicle accident, he had consulted five neurosurgeons. He was from a different state. He was managed initially uh, conservatively for three months, and uh, two to three months, and then he subsequently underwent this fusion. And uh, th this was his construct. Uh, left is a pre-op image uh, from that CT scan that I sc uh, scrolled through, a scout image, because that's the only image we had. And then the right's the uh, post-op image that he presented with. So his presenting complaint was a his, progressive vulture neck, yep, uh, uh, severe vulture arpithoracic neck. kyphosis. He's 71, can't now 72. I can't imagine this guy's fault. Very active, 72. Um, he is actually uh, a, mecha a mechanic, has like a shop that he runs that he fixes cars and things. So very active, very well known, uh, wanted to kind of get back to, to doing that on a daily basis. Is he always yes. leaning into the engine when he's working? Because it appears that way. It's his shop. He doesn't work in the shop. He, he has people. It's a high-end place. So so I do have Scully films. I'll get to them in a second or I can get to them first. But here. So these are his uh, Scully films when he presented. I have a MRI first and I'll go through the myelogram as well. So we started doing the workup for him when he saw us one year after his fusion. Thoracic cervical MRIs again with a with the hardware hard to see but no significant compression anywhere. Um, bone density looked okay, normal for his age group. CT myelogram and scoliosis films again. Um, cord looked okay through and through. So, uh, lower screws are becoming loose, as you know, and, and uh, he's falling over more. Do you have, do you have flexion extensions or, or pictures with him on a bolster? No. So I do a so-called recumbent test. I lay them on flat on their bench, and I then measure their occiput distance to look the at, bench. Look at the difference between his thoracic scan and his cervical scan. I mean, he's at 90 degrees here, and he's up about 60 degrees there. There's probably a jog of motion, but I still had a whole fist with, I actually took a clinical picture of it. It's in the media somewhere. The occiput basically stays away from the bench when he's laying down. And his uh, thoracic screw, you can see the bottom end of it here. It remains kind of the same yeah. there. They're, they're toggling in a bone. But yeah. So, the, I mean, he's 70 some years old. I mean, the real, quite, very the real question for him is, is how big of a surgery is he willing to go through to correct his problem, which is pain? This isn't dangerous to him. Right. You know, he's not going to become paralyzed from this. This isn't dangerous. You know, so some people may scare him and say he's dang. I don't. Th I don't see any danger in this. If he gets neurological symptoms down the road, you could deal with it. But I don't think that's likely. The question is: is how big of a surgery is he willing to go through? Because the surgery's big. Right. I mean, it's you know there is a way to correct this, and you can make him better. It's a carpentry problem, uh, and you can make him better. You can you know you can reposition him. You got to go down around the thoracic curve into the low thoracic spine, but you can osteotomize him and correct him every time. Um, the question is, does he want that big of a surgery? So he would like to, he doesn't want to race anymore. He actually raced on the active circuit, uh, but he's very active. I mean, he has a high end shop. Um, he can't sit in his cars. He has, again, a very nice collection. He can't sit in his cars anymore. His contour prevents him from yeah. sitting in a car. Yeah. Huh? Not be able to swallow. Is well, he, is he having trouble swallowing? He did. He did. And I, I have that later, but he had some trouble swallowing. He ended up getting a peg as well for that. He had lost significant weight and uh, he also got a pneumonia because of the, because after this uh, kind of. Uh, he has a peg already? He got one after 
after he when he left here. For John, that's but he presented with already some some swallowing difficulty. And he had an old fracture dislocation of his uh, subaxial spine, so he's he's remained subluxed here, and he healed in kyphosis here. So, um, yeah, yeah, you have to do, you have to do I mean, the problem with guys is I, I mean the, the fracture is almost irrelevant to me. I mean his problem, his whole deformity is that fracture down below, and it's funny I, I've made that mistake where you don't want to make your incision long. And so you put the thoracic screws in and you angle them down and it always bites you in the ass. Pardon my French. See how the screws come from the top down yeah. instead of making them parallel with the end plate? I think they were at one point. Look what happened. Yeah. Look what the I think, but I think if you go all the way back to the original ones, I don't, I think you could have dropped your hand down. I, I, I mean, I've done it before. I'm just, yeah. I think it's, and they, they, you know, they plow them out at a time as they go, they yeah. go over. I mean, I think, it, you know, the succumb to Jesus talking, the guy does have a huge canal, which is kind of nice. Yeah. But I think you're talking about, I, I might even go back to that. He's got that vertebral fracture right there that's kind of makes you look at it. But you're going to need to break all of his ribs above it. So you either do a T2 osteotomy, which is probably what you need. I don't think it's T2. What, where's that? What's that? Where's T5. That T5 is the. Yeah, it's a V-con. Do a VCR at T5 mm -hmm. and. You know, I would tell him, you know, because he is kyphotic above that and below it, you could do some ponties above and see what you got. I would tell him we're not going to bring him back perfect, but his head will be up. And I would do a T5 vertebral column osteo, you know, resection. I would come all the way down around the, the apex of the thoracic spine. And I might do some ponties above to see what I could get out of that area above. But, you know, I would tell him the goals are limited to, get some correction, but he, he better be willing to go through a big high risk surgery. He better be, he better be debilitated. He was. I mean, he, yeah. He'd visited five different surgical centers in the Western U S and we're like number six, I think Kirk, is it worth the effort 71, but again, extremely mentally, physically, economically engaged. You and I are not too far from 71. So. <laughs> No, I think if you ask 10 spine surgeons what to do, you're going to get 10 different answers here. So it's difficult yeah. to say. I would like to, and somebody who's had all this work done before, there's going to be a great deal of scar tissue in the front just from the trauma of his accidents and then the surgery. I think this can be done if you're just trying to realign him all from the back yeah. with uh, an extension osteotomy at the apex of that curve. Uh, done through the pedicles and uh, but then yeah as everybody says you're going to have to carry it down to the bottom of the thoracic spine the other problem you have is he fractured his sternum at the time of this and he's got an angular deformity of his deform of his sternum so if you're going to correct this at t5 and you can see it on your view there it'd be nice to have a chest ct but you can see the angular deformity of his sternum and I think it was fractured at the time. Yeah. And so it may be hard to correct. So if you're going to do this with a VCR, I would probably cut the ribs on several levels, a few levels yeah. above and below to mobilize that spine and get it detached from the sternum. That so the, the microphone, John, hypothetically speaking. So he had the C67 subluxation or facet injury and he had a T5 burst fracture. He was miraculously neurologically normal. There's actually a video online, right, uh, Neil, that shows yeah. this crash. So uh, what would you have done? Would you have just fixed them right away? Sternal fracture, you just hit one of those key uh, support things. And from where to where? How high, how low? I mean, I, I think they did a long segment. I mean, I, I might have gone a couple, another level down or so, but I, I don't think they, I think their idea wasn't bad. I mean, I, th I think you had to get well above it. The other problem I think you're going to have correcting them is those lateral mass screws, at least on the one side, are all pulled out. They're gone. And you may have trouble with the lateral masses and at first glance of the C2 pedicles. I don't think you could put pedicle screws in. Maybe on maybe on that side, but not the other side. And so I think your fixation points proximal are compromised. You know, I, I think in all honesty, they you know, they their their construct was probably long enough, maybe one level below. So I think they had the right idea, but they, they didn't get him corrected. And all right, Neil, take us forward. So we had extensive discussions with him, and so yeah, yeah and just uh, real quick, this we we used to do some of these conferences that have the worst 
cases that you've ever been involved in, this may be a candidate. Uh, this person has a cervical a thoracic junction that's horizontal. This is horrible. I don't know how you're going to fix them, but I'm interested in seeing what's going to happen here. Um, I would have recommended to do nothing and tell him to get rid of his vintage cars and take up a recumbent bike because he's in a perfect position for a recumbent bike. But let's see what you guys did to him. So we, we did put in C2 pedicle screws um, and uh, went down to L1 and IDO at, um, at the, around the fracture site or T5 to correct that and made a a little bit of osteo, drill down the facet joints at C6-7 uh, before we flipped him um, prone. And then since we had drilled out that jumped facet, we were able to get uh, osteotomy and uh, anterior cajun at C6-7 and corrected him anteriorly, went back posteriorly and uh, locked him in place with compression of around the ideal site. And uh, this is his outcome. And I have Scully films after this. Did you do osteotomies at any site other than that? Did you do any wantons above or below? Uh, the, it was, was mostly fused. Distance? It was mostly fused, and she had some nonions in the subaxial spine. They may have helped a little bit. We did basically a full release at C6, 7 front and back after the heart was put in, and we did an interdiscal osteotomy. I'll just run to the outcome image. Get rid of his peg. Yep. Yep. He got rid of his peg, and two years later, he called us during Christmas, said, "Hey, uh, I'm very pleased with the results, and uh, thank you." He's very grateful. That that's pretty amazing. But you could have got a better deal on some of those cars because he wasn't going to be able to drive them. Now he's going to be able to drive them for a long time. <laughs> and I'm I'm worried about. We actually I think decompressed them later at L45 decompression down here. I wanted to avoid a fusion. He was actually just happy with the decompression. Nowadays, I'd probably put a certain manufacturer's little clip in there. So um, the mid thoracic spine's better, too. No quantities or anything. Yeah, I think we've decorticated every facet joint, but I, he looked pretty ankylosed. Yeah, we did facetectomies on him at every level uh, to try to get whatever we could out of him under contour at the rods. Also, I think here. Lordotic pre, pre this. Yeah, I think oh, well, that just connected out. just here. I think he, he was hyperlordotic. And, and like Neil and Ann said, yeah, what, what follows downstream from a correction up the top. Uh, is is amazing uh, because you correct the problem, and your hi lumbar hyperlordosis and eventual low back pain will probably improve. We did not take the surgery light heartedly. Let me tell you, this was um, there was a lot of discussions about this, and this was eight ten hour surgery because we did a back front back uh, procedure to take the hardware out. And he's uh, back to, he's not by agreement, he's not racing anymore, but uh, he's been sighted test driving his vehicle still. So, and he's uh, a couple of years out now, and I just, this is how I was reminded of his case. He called yet again at the Christmas time. This was Christmas a couple of years ago and uh, said, I'm just doing great and deeply grateful. So no, no, no cars for sale, sadly, but <laughs> yeah, the, the, the point from Harborview days was that when you have non-contiguous fractures, you probably want to at least fix one decisively and maybe even both. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, I think we'll hear some lectures about that tomorrow. Rod long, fuse short, is that making a comeback? So, and this man initially, uh, would there have been a role for, and I'll ask Jim Harrop maybe first, for a multi-level posterior instrumentation without a fusion and then take the hardware out later or a, a decisive selective fusion, hypothetically looking back. For this guy? Yeah, initially. Oh, I don't think so. Just fix him. I, right I mean, I think you got to fix him. I mean, he had, he had a, his neck injury is pretty bad. He had yeah. set dislocation. I mean, I think you got I mean, if, if you want to do a front back on his neck and definitively fix that, I think that's one thing. And maybe you could address the, you know, the two definitive different operations. That may be a different way to do it. Um, because I think such a long construct kind of pulled on his, made him fall over. So you might have gotten away if you did, you know, a single AP segment over five six segment, and then brought him back and did a lower segment down on his thoracic fracture. I mean, that's the only other. That's the only other way I would approach it. I, I don't fault the guys with the first operation. Hey, I love those cross links. I love cross links. We're on the same page. We're especially often on the same page. Nuj, any uh, words of wisdom? 
think it was a great result. What a um, nice result. That I just, you know, I, I think the intradiscal osteotomy is is in your hands is so well done. Uh, I would have done a T5 VCR, like John said, and relied on compression to get, to get that uh, correction of the kyphosis there. Um, and the the C67. Um, I don't know that I would have done, gone to the front. I think I would have probably done it all from the back, but I can't fault this. I mean, this is the result you want. Yeah, for, for me, the problem was this fixed uh, cervical subluxation that basically would mar any attempt at a thoracic surgery. So uh, you kind of would still have this. So we want to have basically full mobility. Did, did you do it in one day or not? Yeah, it was okay. eight, 10 hours. It was back, front, back. It was, it was a one OR. From it's amazing how much you got the correction of the, the kyphosis down below where the fractures were, right? Because if you look at those, if you go ahead and put up that, uh, the, uh, the sagittal there again, you, you can, uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing with a lot of the kyphotic deformity was, was addressed below where the, really the fractures were. Yeah. And so that's, that's pretty amazing. I thought he was going to be fixed, to be honest with you. I thought he was going to be stuck in that position. I think you that's only did an anterior at one level, and you only did an osteotomy. I mean, you did a full osteotomy. It's like a VSO, but right. we, uh, we don't resect the vertebra. We just cut through the. You just cut it. And you basically compress it back. Yeah, but make sure we all the way through. But you would you would expect to see that kind of correction. You would have to do multiple levels, like four or five. That's we just do facetectomies. I wouldn't call them full pontes. Sometimes you see that in kids when you're doing young, you know, younger kids because they're a little bit more mobile, but. I can't believe that that was correct. Can, can you go back to the other? Yeah. I, I think what he does is he corrects, he develops his thoracic lordosis. That's his compensatory mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he can't look up. In order right. to be horizontal, yeah. he bring, by fixing his head, his whole thoracic became better. Like yeah. when you put him on the table, I bet you a lot of that went away. Exactly. Well, obviously it did because he only went like a couple levels that you did osteotomies at. But it, it's amazing to see that kyphosis. If you saw that kyphosis and and it was a fixed kyphosis, you'd be like, man, this is going to take multiple levels to try to even get him even just a little bit better. But you guys straighten him up. That's it's pretty amazing. I had once again. I think it's the cross links. I really do think it's a cross links. The cross links are the difference. Absolutely. I remember there was horror of standing yeah. basically on my side. I was getting a torticollis. From the surgery. How'd you actually position him to begin with, right? Because that's the we hardest part. Mayfields, uh, we used Mayfields, and uh, it was literally. Did you scrub out and then go out to the top of the head yep. and pull him up? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I yeah. still do that. It's a good move. Andrew, any thoughts from your end? No, I mean, it's a fantastic result, Jens. It's just absolutely spectacular. The question is up front would you have done a C2 to T10 in him? And just initially? Yeah, and yes. try to get him reduced and try to, to, to assume that you had to go way below that thoracic kyphosis. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of these interesting case discussions on Tuesday evenings about um, dropped heads and similar st situations. And it's really remarkable to see how the general trend, like from my UCSF friends, is going lower and lower and lower and yeah. lower. Yeah, I mean, and not, not C2 to the pelvis, but... Yeah, yeah. no, but uh, I mean, Zig Bourbon, uh, if you don't do C2 to L1, he kind of doesn't look at you right. And, uh, he, he has had a couple of C2 to pelvis surgeries that are staging procedures for C1 to C2 fixation after the odontoid breaks. But uh, yeah, the, these are very unforgiving cases and the spine really wants to equilibrate it. So those are very insightful statements that Jim made. So now I mean, the, the point for me is that uh, recognizing the injury in the first place, classifying it correctly would have saved a lot of headaches. And this was, this was a backbreaker on our surgical team several years ago. It was, and I was very grateful that it went very well. And um, he had swallowing difficulties, but he had that before. And we had talked about that fortune before. He was relatively emaciated. For these more drop, this is not a dropped head syndrome. I insist on a peg tube beforehand for like a month plus because they all have some dysphagia afterwards. So, and he was actually very receptive towards that. His wife was less, but um, uh, after three months, we took it out and he went back to normal swallowing. So. But yeah, then did you navigate those screws or not? Nope. Good nope. for you. No. Lucky. But thank you all for being here. Thank you for your um, commentaries. And we'll have a full day tomorrow. And so thank you for the presentations to our fellows and to SSF for staying late. And the industry support and our colleagues who've come by here and contributed 
comments and hopefully we'll have many more interactions tomorrow. The lectures tomorrow will be relatively brief and always point counterpoint so that uh, we have vibrant discussions. The discussants chairs are here and whoever wants to sit up there to help discuss is welcome to. We have some great surgical demonstrations also and um, some state-of-the-art techniques. I'm really looking forward. I always learn something from the demonstrations from our uh, faculty. So thank you all for coming together tonight.